Welcome to another episode of the Feature Presentation Podcast, where every week we take a deep dive into the trenches of independent filmmaking. I'm your host, Derek Diamond, and I've been really excited to chat with my guest for this week's show. He is an actor, writer, producer, and best-selling author, Mr. Jeff Ballo. Jeff, how are you, sir? I'm good, Derek. How are you? Doing fantastic. It's funny because before we actually started recording the episode, you know, we were just going on and on about different topics, and we were both like, I think we need to just get the show started before we <laughs> exactly. say everything that we need to. I'm going to say all the good stuff in the, pre, in the pre-interview. <laughs> yeah, in the pre-interview. So, uh, so how, how are things out? Uh, you're, you're based out of Los Angeles. How, how are things out, out there Los on Angeles the West now. Coast? Yeah, things are going, things are going fine. You know, it's hot. It's a, it's summer. It's uh, I try to stay in the air conditioning as much as possible and stay out of the sun because I have that ever so sensitive skin. <laughs> yeah. As, as a native Floridian, I absolutely feel your pain. I, I feel like when it comes to heat waves, our home States get the worst of it. Texas so. would be up there too, but it, it's just, yeah. it's insane right now. You gotta, you gotta learn to adapt. I think. <laughs> <laughs> just for your own sanity. But yeah. Absolutely. So uh, before we dive into, you know, your your screenwriting and all your other accolades in the industry, what was it that initially made you want to get started in the crazy world of filmmaking? Oh, I mean, I started as a child. So I started, as, I, I, I remember being a five-year-old, six-year-old. Like, I don't know how old I actually was. It's probably closer to eight or 10, to be honest. But I was on a, on a, I had a paper route when I was a kid and I used to ride through five thirty in the morning, throwing the papers at the, it's back in when papers were hard copy <laughs> um, at the front porches and dreaming about uh, dreaming about what, what I would dream about would was being characters of my own invention on my favorite TV shows. So it'd be like, uh, like I was a big fan of cheers back in the day. And I always used to imagine myself as Sam Malone's long lost son. Cause you know, he was a philanderer on the show. So one day I would just appear in my imagination as, so it was sort of like this combo actor, writer, dreamer kid. Um, and then when I was about 12 years old, I, uh, I really was convinced that my life was passing me by and I just had to grab the bull by the horns. And, uh, I, a guy at uh, this church that I went to at the time uh, had this recurring role on a soap opera called Santa Barbara. So of course he was mega famous in my imagination and uh, he knew the the keys. So I reached out to him and said, Hey, you know, how, how, how do I break in? <laughs> and he gave me some, uh, some advice that no longer even holds true. There was a publication called drama log back in the day and you would scour the uh, casting notices in the back and he said, get some headshots done and, and uh, send them off to the people there and see if you can get in some short films or whatever. And uh, eventually got an agent and got some acting gigs as a kid. It's interesting your story specifically because so many people move out to Los Angeles for that particular reason to be an actor or be a director, but you grew up in the LA area. So yeah. how was how was that for you? Just because it had to be just constantly around you all the time. Well, so my family uh, and nobody in my sort of immediate circle was really in the industry, so it wasn't uh, it wasn't that close, but it was sort of ever present. So. Uh, you always knew someone who at least knew someone who was in the industry in some capacity. And often that was just, you know, uh, someone in, who worked in catering or someone who was, you know, an, an, a secretary at, a, at an ed- editing office facility or whatever. Uh, so, but there was all, it was always that kind of a thing. So there was just always people along the way in all the different facets of it. So it, it the, I think, I think what it did for me was that it made me realize that you know, it's just an industry like everything else. Like it didn't seem like the idea of pursuing the film industry or or acting as a career didn't seem in any way odd or impossible. When I, when I'll, I know I'm cutting ahead a little bit. When I moved to Australia, uh, I found that, you know, nobody even took it seriously as a viable pursuit. And because they didn't, Like nobody would do the things necessary to develop the skills you need to be able to do that well. Whereas in LA, because it's all around you, everyone's working at it. Everybody's pursuing it. And so people, people are 
trying to get better at it. And, and I think if there's a grand distinction out of it, I would say something like that, you know, where it's, if you believe something is possible, you will do what is necessary to develop the skills to achieve that thing. If you don't believe it's possible at all, you just never really, you never really take those steps in the first place. And, um, and I think that's probably, that's probably my, that's probably the biggest single thing I would say. And it's true because a lot of it has to do with your mental state of mind. You know, can sure. you do it? Because if you if you build it up to this kind of impossible goal, you're never going to be able to achieve it because chances are you're going to be afraid to do it. And that's where a lot of people say, oh, it'd be fun to do something like that. But it, it's getting over the hump of realizing, you know, it. yeah, it's not easy, but there's no other satisfaction quite like it. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, I've done... I mean, I started as a child actor, but like I got into film production and I got into, you know, work and crew and I, I, I've done, I mean, you name it, I've done it. I always say I've done every job on a film set or assisted the person who does that job. Uh, and, and not just on this film set, but pre-production and post-production and distribution and marketing and, and development and all that stuff. So uh, just when you see something like that from all the different angles, it, it's, it really is not a question of, can it be done? The question is, how well are you doing it really? And so if you're like, I don't know, I, I don't know your audience terribly well, but if they're just starting out, for example, you should never think I can't do this. You may be in the very early stages. So you may not really have the skills necessary to succeed in that arena, but that doesn't mean you can't develop those skills. I believe, I genuinely believe anyone can develop the skills, including something sort of obscure like screenwriting or sort of the creative genesis side of it, you know? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And that's part of the fun though, is learning by failing, you know, like you may have this For mindset sure. of your, you're going to fail, but that's kind of the best way to learn. You know, I, I look back at, you know, my last short film I did a few years ago and would I do anything different? Probably not, but I wouldn't have learned what I did had I not done them. So that that's half the fun. I love the fact that For you sure. brought up that you can do anything on a film set. And that's what I tell people is that get on as a PA and just watch oh, yeah. the DP, watch the director, watch watch everyone do their job like that's classes are great but doing is the best way to learn i think you know i used to be very against classes to be honest with you because i started in a very sort of the it's ironic because i was all I, I was an actor so as an actor it was like always acting classes like i can't remember a time in my childhood when i wasn't going to acting classes so it's like I spent a lot of time and energy on that. I, I've met writers throughout the years who, who have this weird idea that if you can't magically spin great words and create compelling stories, you don't have it. But it's like, like you have to consistently develop the craft. So it's like there's the there's the doing of it. But there's also the the formal learning of it. I mean, there we do know a lot about these things, right? The dynamics of storytelling, or the or the the nuances of acting, and there's different theories and different sort of approaches to all these different things. And I think there's a, especially in the indie world, there there can be a very much uh, I have to go my own way to sort of prove myself as an original, right? And it's like. Yes, I, I understand because I was I was that right. But the the longer I've been at it, it's kind of like yeah, like take that, but also take the benefit of knowledge and expertise that people have acquired over the years, so that you're not reinventing the wheel all the time or or making mistakes that really, with just a little bit more knowledge or, or expertise, you wouldn't have to make that mistake. You'd still make a mistake. It would just be a, a bigger, better mistake, right? Like it would get you further. So, yes, <laughs> to your point, yes, uh, but with a caveat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, and you're you're absolutely right. And that's what's great about the modern world we live in is that you have masterclass, you have wow. YouTube tutorials, you have all these great resources to learn acting, screenwriting, 
you know, various yeah. things like that. It, it's it's really incredible to see the resources that 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 we have. It is. It's a, it can be a little frustrating for someone like me because um, I have found that people also at the same time have enough information and access to information that we can convince ourselves that we know more than we do. And we can convince ourselves that we don't need any more because I got it covered because I watched a hundred YouTube videos on it, or I took a master class class or what have you. And so much of like my frustration with it all is just that there's everybody's got a perspective, everybody's got an angle, and they're often teaching what they know or what their what their perception of it is to the exclusion of other things. It's almost like um, just the way things get, the way sort of business and marketing works, you almost have to push the other, the other op- options away to hold up your own as the solution to the thing, right? And it's like, so everybody's sort of saying, well, that's not the way to do it, or that's not the way to do it my way is the way to do it. And so it's, it, it can very much end up being a uh, confusing, cluttered space. And so I've just found over the years, because I've been teaching, I don't, I don't know what, uh, how much you know about what I do, but I've been teaching screenwriting for like 25 years now. And, and part of the problem is that people don't know what they don't know. And so there are gaps that we have. And, and to be perfectly honest with you, watching a bunch of YouTube videos or doing a mash class or whatever doesn't necessarily fill in some of those gaps. And so people make the same mistakes or they, they spend in these circles over and over. And it's very easy to, it's very easy to sort of mollify ourselves. Was that the right word <laughs> to, to sort of get a, this sense that we're, we're making a forward progress that maybe we're not really making because we're determined to, either do it our way or we're determined to sort of accept that we already know what we need to know. I just, I just think what's really important for people is to just go into it all with a very open mind and understand that no matter what, you know, there's always more to know. And if we, and if we genuinely go in with that approach and like, what can this situation teach me? What can this interview teach me? What can, uh, you know, the person that I meet, who's, who's doing, who's a grip on a film I'm working on, right? Like that person probably has something that they can teach me. And if you sort of go into that, in, into everything with that mindset, I think you can't really lose. So. No, you, and you brought up exactly what I was going to say that it, yeah, even though you may watch some YouTube videos or take a master class or two, you should always be wanting to learn more and learn different methods and different ways and how different people work. Like you would work differently than I do. You know, I might work differently than other people that I've had on my show, but always keep an open mind and keep your ego in check is yeah. the, the, and, the and right way to say it. it. It's true. No matter how high we climb up a ladder too. So yeah. Yep. Nope. No, That's, you're absolutely and it's right. harder. It's harder to keep your ego in check as you sort of develop skills and and, and acquire accolades. You know, it's riding that fine line between being confident and being arrogant. Absolutely, for sure. Yeah, you need you need a you need an internal drive. You need an internal um, confidence, but but you always have to temper that with with, uh, I know better than everybody else kind of attitude. So yeah. Yep. I agree. No, you're, you're absolutely right. So you mentioned moving to Australia. What was mm. it that caused you to move to Australia? And uh, cause I I've been getting into more international type films. Like I'm kind of going through a Japanese film phase right now, learning more about mm. films you made in other countries. And I recommend any filmmaker current or aspiring to do the same. So what, what, caused you to move out to Australia and what was your time like there? Well, uh, back in the day I was, uh, I had, uh, I'd actually gone to Japan a few years earlier. It was my first big overseas trip and I was just like blown away by the, the how ev- literally every single thing was different. Like the color schemes were different. The sounds were different. The smells were different. The feel of the air was different because it's more humid than in LA. And it was like the technology and the, it was, I loved it. The language, even the letters, like everything was just different. And I was like, 
this is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. So I want to see the whole world. <laughs> I was just became obsessed with that. Um, at the time, I, I had a girlfriend and we were, you know, had been together for quite a while. Uh, I had met a guy who was an Australian who was studying acting. We became good friends. And he said, if you're ever in Australia, come on down and uh, I'll put you up. You got a place to stay. So when I ended up breaking up with my girlfriend after a number of years, I thought, you know, there's no, there's no other time to go. Uh, there's a funny thing that happens when you grew up in LA and you start acting at a young age is there's this, there's this really, I don't know what the word is, but there's this sense that LA is the only place there is. And if I take even a small trip away, I'm going to miss the one big opportunity that <laughs> has so far eluded me. Right. And so uh, as I was pursuing acting, I just would never go on big trips. And so this was my opportunity basically. And I, I decided to go down there and um, I fell in love with that place as well. <laughs> fell in love with Australia, fell in love with New Zealand, fell in love again <laughs> um, and uh, ended up just staying down there. So uh well, while I was down there, my friend and I attempted to make a little independent film and uh, I just loved everything about it. One of these days, I want to make it to Australia. I've seen pictures and video and whatnot. I'm sure it doesn't do it justice, but I'm jealous of that and the fact that you went to Japan. I've been fascinated with the Japanese culture since I was a kid. Oh, I've, I, 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 I was, uh, I was studying Japanese for a while and I'm, I'm a, I was a big Japanophile at the, <laughs> for a long time. I still think it's just an amazing, amazing culture. So, and it's a, but again, there, there again, and this is, I think from a filmmaking standpoint or from a, from a creative person standpoint, I think it's important to travel if you can. I think it's important to see different, to see the world through different lenses. You know, I'm a big, I'm a big, uh, one of my sort of core philosophies or ideas is that every single one of us has a unique window on the world. Like no one else will ever see the world the way you see it. It'll, it'll, you've had experiences, you've had uh, interactions with people, you have different, you know, DNA and brain chemistry, and it gives you an imagination that only you will ever have, which means you have stories that only you will ever tell. And if you go to other cultures and you meet people that live very wildly outside of your experience, it colors and shapes the way you see the world in, in pretty profound ways, to be honest. And, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I wouldn't say to be jealous of these things, but I would say certainly, you know, aspire to them and, and, and go if you ever have the chance. I think anyone who's a creative person should go wherever they get a chance to go. What was the filmmaking scene like in Australia? Well, so my friend was uh, was in the acting scene, so I didn't really get too much into the filmmaking scene. I was sort of in the acting scene there for for a while. I was teaching some acting there with him, and we were trying to make our little indie film. And it was a it was a little sixteen millimeter film, and we were shooting it, you know, on a on a film camera and cutting it on a flatbed editing table and. Uh, you know, it was, it was, uh, evenings and weekends over the span of a couple of years kind of a thing. Um, so I wasn't necessarily plugged into the film scene that well, but, uh, I, I did start looking for, that was when I first started looking for screenplays to produce as a follow-up to that project. And when I put, um, uh, a call out for screenplays Australia wide, and I got like 300 submissions in and, they were at least this is turn of the century. They were like, not great, you know? Uh, and so that's what prompted me into teaching this stuff was, was that. So I, I can't speak to the industry itself other than it's small and it's accessible. And because it's small and accessible, uh, I maintain that, you know, if you, if you develop the skills, it's it's even more achievable. So coming from somewhere like LA, where it seems like everybody's got a screenplay under their arm and everybody knows somebody who knows somebody. And so everybody's like, you're in, right? Like, oh, you meet somebody who's, who's uh, you know, serving hors d'oeuvres at a, at, at, a, at a party or something. And they've got a, a claim to have a three picture deal at Sony or something. It's like, right. And then there's that extreme, but you go to Australia and it's like, nobody knows 
anything about it, but the local film body needs to fund local films. So there's this, you know, there's this gap between, uh, between the possibilities and the accessibility of it. Uh, but the frustrating thing is because nobody believes it's real, nobody pursues it. And so, you know, I read 300 scripts over a six month span of time down there and I, was committed because I know what it's in, what's involved in writing. So I was committed to reading them all cover to cover and literally found nothing, not even, not even one that was worthy of even a complete rewrite. Like it was nothing. <laughs> this is, you know, this is going back 20 something years, but uh, I'm not sure things have changed too terribly much. Um, except the only difference I think today is that it is that everything is, everything today is as, is as accessible as it was in Australia back in the day. That's some insane dedication to read that amount of screenplays in that time. That's... Oh, it took six months. It was, it was crazy. And like, especially when they're not that great <laughs> because you're like, I don't really need to keep reading this, but I'm going to do it in solidarity to my writers. You know, <laughs> it's like, no, don't need to do that. <laughs> That's when I realized that you didn't you didn't need to read a whole screenplay to know if it was viable or not. I, I would I, I would keep changing how much of the screenplay I had to read. So I committed to reading all of it, but then I realized nah, I really only need to read about thirty pages. And then I realized nah, I really only need to read about ten pages. Nah, I really only need to read about one page, to be honest with you. And uh, yeah, it's it, you can you can tell remarkably much by a single page. So. Know that going into it, writers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was yeah. curious as to how long it takes you to realize uh, this isn't that great, or hey, there might be there might be something there. Well, so for me, uh, so it really depends on what you're reading it for. To be honest with you, so if I'm reading it to to try to find a project, then I really only need the logline because, and not even because of the story that the log line will convey, but because of how well the log line is written. Because if the log line is not written effectively, I know the screenplay is not going to be written effectively. And if the screenplay is not written effectively, it kind of doesn't matter how good the idea is because it's going to need so much work to re to fix it. And that writer is clearly not capable of that because if they were, they would have fixed it before they ever sent it out to anybody. So I, as an independent producer, don't have the funds to go hire the, the A-lister with, with the top level skills. So I have to pass. You see what I mean? So, so if it's that situation, then I need the log line, maybe send me a one page synopsis. I'll know. I'll definitely know from a one page synopsis. The, um, if I'm looking for, for a writer to either hire or somebody that would I would want to work with, then I'm probably going to need about somewhere between 10 and 30 pages to, to get a sense of it. And, and the reality is a great story. The, a great story should have the, the best moments of it should be well after that. So if you don't have, if you don't have a great start, I know full well that in theory, at least, you should have a great ending, right? Or that like, this is going to go somewhere, but I'm never going to bother. No, it doesn't matter how good it is. If the start is weak, you see what I mean? So it really depends on what people are looking for. And the reality is producers, production companies, they're looking for different things. So one of the frustrations I think writers often have is that they, they imagine that there is a, like, if my project is good enough, it will appeal to all producers. And it's like, no, we're kind of like writers, like we're all different, right? If you imagine 10 different writers writing uh, a love story between two characters, the same basic plot, you're going to have 10 different writers writing 10 different stories. Well, similarly with producers, you're going to have 10 different producers wanting to make 10 different kinds of films, right? Not just genre, but like even within a genre, right? So horror film producers, they're, they're going to want to make 10 different types of horror films, right? So it's, uh, if, if when writers think of producers as this sort of, uh, what's the word? <laughs> uh, this sort of grand block of type of people, there's a word for it, which is escaping me at the moment. Um, that is, you know, that's the, 
that's one of the grand mistakes that writers make. It, it really is about uh, this concept that I discovered along the way called alignment, where you really need to uh, you need to align a, 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 a writer's creative sensibility needs to align with a producer's business and or creative sensibility. And then that those align with a director or actor who wants to make that kind of a story, what have you. So, um, yeah, did that answer? I don't no, know if I go off on. No, it, 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 it answered it and more because I, I did want to talk with you about you know, the, the business side of it as well, because everyone wants to talk about the creative side with the writing, the acting, the directing, but there is the business side to it as well. And you have to be able to sell it to a producer and, and also learn how to work with them and learn how they work and what they're looking for. And that's, that's where I think a lot of people get, I want to say shaken up is the right way to describe it, but it's almost like they can't get out of their own mind, like the picture it a certain way. And then when the producer says, no, that's not what I'm looking for. It's like, yeah, but this is so good. How can you not see it? The, I think the biggest challenge, particularly for newer writers is that they're, they're blinded by their own idea. You have an idea for a movie or TV show or whatever. And in your imagination, you know what it looks like. And so it has to look like that or it's wrong. Like they're like the producer, the director, the lighting guy, whatever, the actor, they're making the wrong choices. It's supposed to look like this. And it's like, well, if you were a painter and all you had to do was spend about 25 bucks and get all the paints you need in an easel and a, and a, and a canvas and paint it yourself, you can make it look like whatever you think is the right way to make it look. But when it comes to a film, you have we have to you know wrangle like immense resources that cost money and involve people's time and locations and visual effects and like there's there's a laundry list of even in the low budget or even no budget realm you're still talking about people's time and like bringing resources together. So whether it's on the on that lower budget level, it's the resources or whether it's on the bigger budget level where it's a lot of money at stake, like that just means there are going to be a lot of people who have a lot of opinions on what the what the painting, as it were, is is supposed to look like. And so just because the writer has created the story or imagined it up in the first place doesn't mean that they are the final say in what that film looks like. Because at the end of the day, nobody reads the words. It's not, the, the audience doesn't read the words. The audience looks at the pictures, the audience watches the actors. And so what screenwriters are really doing is kind of painting a picture for the people who make the movie. And so it, and so it re, you really have to be open to uh, a variety of input. and. To that point, I would say the the what's exciting about it is that the film industry, the different jobs in the film industry are all creative. So the director is a creative person. The lighting person is a creative person. The, the prop master and the costume designer, the set designer, the editor, these are creative people. And so if the writer, it if they're really a... If they're if they are truly creative, then when they write their story, they will understand they're writing their story for a collaborative medium. And if they're writing for a collaborative medium, you are going to get the benefit of all those creative minds making your words even better than you might imagine them to be. And so I think I think it's a problem with newer writers that are very much about, it's my idea, it's my story, I have to, you know, keep it t tight to my chest, and don't steal it, and I'll never have another good idea, so this is my one and only. Um, you know, it's it, the, the, the reality is this brain that we all have is a creativity engine, and as a creativity engine, you have plenty of ideas and plenty of stories. And if somebody comes up with a better idea that, that enhances your own story, you have the creative capacity to then use that and sort of take it even further. So if, if writers can embrace that kind of perspective on it all, that's when, that's when we get into the good stuff, you know? I, I 
can't agree more with what you said. It reminds me of a shirt that I saw uh, on Facebook a while back. It simply said, mm-hmm. ego kills talent. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it's very true because if you're so passionate about your idea, like if you're speaking as a writer, you should want the idea to be the best that it can possibly be. Sure. And, and, and you know, you might give it like I might give you an idea and then you add something to it that just makes it you know, immensely better. And then you might give it to somebody else and they add something to it that makes it better. Like that's it's the beauty of filmmaking is the collaboration between the different creative types. It, it is actually possible that the ideas that they bring to it will make it lesser. That is possible. And I think that's the I think that that's where writers have this sort of frustration because you can create something that is 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 a great piece of writing, a great piece of work that then someone else doesn't understand a nuance of it or doesn't uh, doesn't doesn't make that interpretation from page to screen in a terribly compelling way. And and so it the end result is something weak, like one of the one of the one of the big motivators for people to become screenwriters in the first place is they go and they watch a crappy movie. They go, I can do better than that. And then they want to go out and make a movie. But the assumption is that that was the writer's fault. And in fact, you get critic reviews that are like, the writing was terrible on this thing. I'm like, did you read the screenplay? Because I didn't see them handing out the screenplay. You you know what I mean? Like there's this weird assumption that whatever's on the screen was written by the writer and very much it's a collaborative medium. The thing that's on the screen is the interpretation of the writer's work. Some of it may have seeped through and ended up on the screen unchanged. Some of it may not. And, and so you can't judge the quality of a writer by the end product of the film. Great scripts get turned into really crappy movies and not really the other way around. Usually, (laughs) you know, you don't usually see a, um, a crappy script get turned into a good movie. There pretty much has to be a good script going into it to, to become a good movie. <laughs> but that may not just be from that one initial writer's work. You know, it might be a, a rewriters or silent rewriters or, you know, partnerships or, or what have you that, that refine the words. So. Yeah. And that's something that I've learned too, is that, you know, there's so many different factors that go into it that you can't really judge it based off of one thing like you can't just assume that the script is bad you know there's so many different other factors that go into it and it's it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier with keeping an open mind and you saying that yeah the collaboration you might result in a lesser idea it could result in a better idea it's really learning like what can work and what can't and I think it's op- it's about being open to where the creative collaboration takes you because the a film is a film is a weird thing because like everybody starts out trying to make a great film. Nobody starts out trying to make a pile of garbage unless they're just pursuing sort of some monetary gain, but that's actually not as common as you might imagine. Like most people are trying to make a decent film, what whatever they consider to be decent. So, but there's so many variables. There's so many variables, like things that are potentially completely out of your control. And so sometimes you just have to adapt to what happens on set or, you know, actor breaks their leg. So that shot that you, that you had in mind, you got to cheat it because you, so you can't see the, the leg or whatever. And now suddenly that's not the shot that you imagined. And does the scene still play that way? Oh, it's a lesser scene, whatever. Like it's, there's just so many variables that you, in some ways you kind of have to go into it uh, with an appreciation for, and, and it, that collaboration and with an appreciation for wherever it may go and sort of being open to that. I, to me, that's the best part of filmmaking is that we kind of don't know what it's going to end up being. <laughs> we, we, this is our target. Let's see what we can get, you know, see what, see what the outcome ends up being. So, no, no, that's that's yeah. great. It's, it, it, I look at film like almost every film as being a miracle because of the work that it takes to put into it, from the writing, sure. directing, getting all the actors together, and that's that's what I've learned to, to love about it is working with people who might you know have different beliefs, different opinions on things, but it's like everybody comes together to make this project happen. It's that's yeah. why I love it. 
It's a project. It's a big project with a lot of resources and a lot of moving parts, and it takes a lot of time to put it together. And so it's, I think it's one of the, it's one of the cool things about it is that at the end of it all, because all those disparate ideas and philosophies and perspectives and maybe political points of view and all that kind of stuff, all these different kinds of people come together to make this thing. And you can step back and look at it and go, Hey, we made this thing. Like that's, that's cool. And if it's good, if it's got a, if it takes the audience on an interesting story journey, um, I mean, that can move people, that can change people and affect the way we see the world. And that's pretty exciting, really. You know, I don't, mm-hmm. I, I can't, I, I've always thought when <laughs> growing up, I was always like, how, like, how do people have any interest in doing anything other than this? I don't understand. I don't understand how people are interested in other things. <laughs> like, like, this is the coolest thing in the world. So. No, I totally agree. So yeah. you mentioned that you've been teaching screenwriting for a number of years, and and you developed what I think is a really cool uh, screenplay system called the Fast uh, Screenplay System. Can you talk to the viewers a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so when when I started teaching screenwriting, it was it was as a um, as a response to the fact that I couldn't find viable material. So as a producer or as a would-be producer, a wannabe producer, uh, I was looking for material that I could package, that I could get that was viable, that I didn't have to, as somebody with no money, pour a bunch of time and resources, money and energy into fixing. Now, I asked everybody and they said, you know, I've got some ideas or I, here's a script. And I was like, that's not a script. <laughs> and it was like, so how do we get someone from this idea all the way to a screenplay, not just a screenplay, but a screenplay that a producer can actually say yes to? And so what I did was I said, I need to sit down and reverse engineer this process. I need to figure out how to get you from point A to point B so that anyone could start here, go through this process and end up here. And and in theory, we have an ever growing number of viable, producible projects. I want to build an independent film studio that makes lots and lots of films. And the only way I'm going to be able to do that is to have a machine that cre- that that is, that does this. But if you look around, or at least at the time, still today, <laughs> for the most part, but if you look around, the, the vast majority of people who teach screenwriting are teaching a story uh, type, right? So you have the hero's journey, you have the three-act structure, you've got the seven steps to this and the nine steps to that and the six story types and blah, 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 right? It was all story-based. And so to me, that's a technique-based approach. So you have an idea for a story. How do I tell that story? Here's a technique for telling that story, right? Um, what I decided to do was take a process-driven approach. So everyone has an idea for a mo- who has an idea for a movie has to sort of sift through all those ideas and focus them into a story, right? To outline it or plan it or sort of go, this is, I think, the story that I want to do then everyone has to go and blast that story onto the page get that first draft written then once you have a first draft everyone has to go through it and rewrite it make it stronger like make it the story you wanted it to be and then everyone who has done that has to then polish the words so that it's an effective read for the reader and so what i did was i said well that that process is the same for everyone like whether you're writing an art house film or a blockbuster you know, run of the mill <laughs> cookie cutter formula thing. Like everyone has to go through the same process. So what I did was build a process based approach, and I I cr- came up with the acronym FAST for focus, apply, strengthen, tweak. So those are the four key parts of the writing process. We have to focus our ideas into a story. We have to apply that story to the page in a first draft. We have to strengthen until it's solid, the story we want to tell. And then we have to tweak it, tweak the words on the page so that when someone picks it up, that they they get so enthralled by that screenplay that they just tear through those pages. It is a fast read, a fast screenplay, right? What When I f- sort of figured that out, I wrote a book about it called Writing Fast, How to Write Anything with Lightning Speed, and sort of s- took that process. I also, at the same time, determined that there is an underlying dynamic to storytelling. So the classic the classic three-act structure is the cla- classic three-act structure, not because every story has to have three acts, but because it most closely reflects the human experience. What's the dynamic underneath all that? The dynamic underneath is ultimately setup and payoff. Everything in a story is either setup or payoff 
or both, where it pays off one thing and then sets up another. There's another element where uh, it's sort of a reinforcement. So it's like uh, you set something up, something else reinforces it, leading to that payoff. But anyway, set up and payoff is that dynamic. So what I then did was I looked at this process, focus, apply, strength, and tweak. And I realized that if I take that, that there needs to be a setup at the beginning and there needs to be a payoff at the end. So the payoff at the end is finding and connecting with your project's ideal producer, because it doesn't make any sense to write a screenplay that you don't then take out into the world, because we don't go on Amazon.com and say, hey, what's the latest unproduced screenplay? I want to have a read. Like, they don't exist. There's no market for it. So the only reason to write a screenplay is to try to turn it into a film. So if you write a screenplay that can't connect with the producer, your screenplay is destined for your book, your bookshelf. So the payoff phase is really all about finding and connecting with your project's ideal producer, how to hook them, pull them in, exceed their expectations, get them more and more excited about reading your project. And then once they do, bang, it's perfect for them, right? So, but when I realized that, I also realized there's a, there's a element missing and it's missing for my book. So I discovered it after I wrote the book, which is that, if I have a script, I can't just assume that I'm going to be able to connect with producers, right? What I actually have to do is align. So the way we align is we send our script out for notes and feedback. And then when we get that feedback, most people do feedback all wrong. They, I send my script to you. I say, give me some feedback. What do you think? Was it good? Did you like it? What do you think? <laughs> right? And you go, oh, I didn't really like, the oh, you know what? You're right. I got, I'm going to change the character. It's like, no, hang on. That's not what feedback is. Feedback is you send your work out for review. Somebody reads the script. They give you notes. They give you their thoughts, whatever. You take that on board. What was I trying to achieve as a writer? Did it land with the reader the way I wanted it to land with the reader? Their feedback tells you that. And if it, if it didn't land the way you wanted it to land, you use that knowledge. You you. We go into, you know, how to decipher notes and figure out what people are really saying. They said they didn't like the character, but really it was just this one line in this one scene and they, they can't pinpoint that. Anyway, uh, so you use that to reshape your project so that before you reach out for the, to the producer, you have a project that you know is perfectly aligned with that producer. Most people who send out scripts, and I still get it to this day, people will say, hey, I wrote the script and I'm looking for a producer. It's like... If you knew anything about me, you would know not to contact me, right? Like, that's not what I just know. Uh, and this is the case with most producers, right? But if you know that your project is aligned with that producer, then connect with them. So anyway, so there's six phases. And then what I realized at the, at the end of it was, if you knew all this at the end, you could actually, at the very beginning, pre-align your imagination with their needs before you began this process. So we set up your imagination to go through this process. So it ends up be becoming a seven phase process. And I would argue everyone has to go through all seven phases to succeed. And it's not, I mean, I sort of analyzed it, broke it down, built the thing. It, you know, it's not just because it's my proprietary thing that I say, like, this is the process. So when I say it's a process-based thing, it's like whether you're writing a three-act structure or a hero's journey or some weird non-linear backward story, some tenet kind of thing, right? Like whatever you are, whatever you're writing still has to go through this process. And so fast screenplay is all about taking people step-by-step -step through that whole process. And then we take all the skills like character building and um, opposition and subplots and pacing and tension and all that stuff. And we sort of weave it into the individual steps so that you, you learn all the skills that you need as you go step-by-step step through the, through that process, as you're building your project. So I don't know if that, <laughs> hopefully that's uh, an encapsulation of it all. But No, no, absolutely. I love what you said about notes and feedback, because a lot of people will just hand their script to a friend and say, let me know what you think. And then you just, you don't really, I don't consider it good, like constructive feedback in a way. Like you might say, uh, it kind of sucked or, oh, it was great. That's my favorite. Oh, it was great. It's like, but that, that doesn't help me get better. Like, like I want to, like, I want it to be better. There are very few people who are skilled at giving you notes on your screenplay. 
Like there are very few people that are skilled at giving you notes on your novel, but like <laughs> on your screenplay, even fewer, right? Because it's not just about what someone, how someone reacted to it. I can read a screenplay and say, uh, I, I don't like this project at all. This is not my thing. I don't like the story. I don't like the message. I don't like what you're doing, but you did it really well. Or, um, or this part over here, the message you're trying to get across is, is, you know, you're, you're, you're working against that message by having this scene over here that you probably love because of this one cool thing that's in it. Right. Like, but there aren't that many people that can give you those, that feedback, certainly not your mom, right. <laughs> or your best friend, like they don't know anything about it. So they're going to read and go, yeah, cool. Like they're, they just don't know. And that's, it's part of the, it's a, it's a fundamental challenge in, in the industry because how do screenwriters get the feedback that they need, right? Like my whole thing is taking you through a process where you're able to decipher notes from all, all different levels of people. So even if your mom tells you it was great or yeah, you know, I wasn't that into it, but whatever is cool. Like, you know, how to, you know what that means, you know, you know where to look based on how you know her. So it's, um, the, the key ultimately, like, I, I can't possibly <laughs> cover all that, but the key takeaway from it is that you, you always just need to go into feedback, understanding that it's not about whether they liked it or not. It's about whether it landed the way you want it to land or not. Cause if it didn't, that's what you need to focus on to improve it so that it lands the way you want it to land. Because as a creative person, it kind of doesn't matter if everybody doesn't like it. It matters what you're trying to say and what you're trying to achieve. Now, as a collaborative business, we have to get producers who like it and want to make that, who are aligned with that creative sensibility or that sort of business aspiration. We want to make a million dollars because it's a kid's film and they sell really well or whatever, right? Like you need to know what that is so if the person is, you know, I, I'm not a horror film fan. Uh, I like don't send me horror films because I'm, it's not my thing. But I can recognize a good horror film, right? So, so ultimately, if you're, so you're, it's never going to quite be aligned with me. So if I say it's not really my thing, that doesn't, that doesn't mean you're a bad writer. That doesn't mean this isn't a good story. That just means it doesn't really land with me because, and so you kind of have to know that going into it to even be able to assess the quality of the feedback that you're getting. So um, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult problem because how do writers get that feedback that they need? It's a very complex, it's much more complex of, of a challenge than we think because you need to know these things. You need to know how your project lands to even have a sense of the things you need to focus on improving, right? So it's, even to get better as a writer, you need this thing that's very elusive and very hard to, to get and to get good quality feedback. What if the person who's reading your project has it in for you or, or you know what I mean? Like they're, they're, they're poisoning your idea with, well, have you thought about this? Or mm, I don't think that's very marketable today or whatever. And it's like, I mean, you have to be able to steal yourself from some of those um, from some of that kind of feedback. And so it's, it, it's challenging. It's a, there's, and there's no easy answer to it. Like, like a lot of things in screenwriting, there's no easy out. It's not like we can flip a switch over here or hire that guy over there. Like, even if you're hiring somebody, they have a, they have a financial interest in giving you some sort of notes. Like they have a, they, there's no financial interest in them going, this is great. I wouldn't change a thing. Like, you'll never get that note when you pay for script coverage, right? Like it's not going to happen. They'd be like, well, there's this, this, and this, because they feel like they need to do it to justify the, the cost. Anyway, I don't want to go too far into the weeds over there, but uh, hopefully that makes sense. It's, it's just, a, it's, it's the nature of the, the amorphous reality of creativity. And in my limited work in film, like to me, the most complex part has been the writing. I don't consider myself to be, you're sure. a great writer. I mean, I I hope that I'm getting better because I was I've wrote plenty of bad material. You know, it's we all have, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yes, but it, it I agree with you. That has been, you know, it can be the most difficult part of it is finding 
if you get just a little feedback on something of finding something of note in the like someone gives you like a two sentence you know review or feedback on something it can be tough to really decipher it but i you've I, and i hope it gives the listeners something to think about because it's definitely given me a lot to think about as far as feedback as well well it's also the it, it also depends on where you are in the process as well because i think one of the reasons it's so challenging is that is that feedback is one when i when i broke this down into the seven phases feedback is one phase like <laughs> Yes, it's a difficult phase, but if you don't understand these other phases, you don't understand how to to use or or adapt to feedback, right? So it's it's like part of the reason I think writers say, "What do you think of my writing?" and use it as a like a validating experience is because they don't know how to improve upon it anyway. If you say, if I say that your, your scene in the, in the third act there isn't quite working because that, you know, whatever, and you don't have a sense of how structure works, like how are you going to go in and fix that? Or, or if you don't understand how the, your, your motif is aligned to the, to the first act and, and the, this push pull thing, like you, I think that's part of where that comes from is what I'm saying. I think that, I think that's part of where those insecurities and and the reason people respond in that way, just know that all of these things are learnable and this process is very clearly mapped out. And it's when you have the tools you need to have, it's actually, it's actually fun to, to get the kind of feedback that, even strikes at your at your heart you're like oh my god this is my favorite scene what do you mean you don't like that scene the whole reason i wrote this script is is you know but with the right set of tools okay i see how now to to make my story 10 times stronger so and and i think go to your other to your other point uh, writing is the hardest one of all of all these skills, I think, because it's the it's the only it's the only thing that we do in the film industry that is original creative. So everything else is adaptive creative. So when I write a screenplay, the director goes, "Oh, I could totally film it like this and blah blah." Like they're creating based on the spark that we provided, right? Like yes, they can come up with their own scenes or whatever, but the the assuming that we're starting with a screenplay the the that's the originator of the creativity so there's something very um uh there's something very shapeless about that right and because of that there's a million different directions we can go so we need the process more so than we need the formula anyway that's my take on it <laughs> no your take everybody <laughs> hot takes here on the show yeah no you're you're Isn't absolutely that... right but in a way the writing can be the most fun because it's like you know if you're a director or a producer you're i i use this analogy a lot you're playing in the sandbox that the writer creates so that aspect absolutely. of it can be fun totally. yeah for sure i think it's i can i think it can be great fun you just have to go into it with the right attitude and not think of it as a as a picasso painting that that needs to end up the way it was in your brain like think of it all think of it always as where could this lead you know yep absolutely well as we start to wrap up here i i the viewers and listeners would probably kill me if i didn't ask this question you were in a pretty popular cult film (laughs) in the early nineties called don't tell mom, the babysitter's dead. I, so uh, before I ask you about your experience (laughs) in making it, I am a huge fan of that era, like the late eighties and early nineties, because it all kind of blends together. And like, a, you know, the eighties are transitioning into the nineties, but you don't, they don't quite know what the decade's going to be like yet. So, and I think, I think, that film really encompasses that. So how, how was your experience in, in making that film? Well, so we made, we shot that film in 1990. And so it's considered it's, they consider it to be like the last eighties film, right? So it came out in 91. It came out like the same weekend or weekend later or weekend before Terminator two came out. So just as some historical reference <laughs> context, um, I mean, look, I was an actor on that. I got hired. I was a, I, I was a bit part. I was one of the stoner friends. Uh, you know, I, I we had, uh, 
We had our first scene, the very first scene I ever shot, which was my first movie scene as an actor ever. We were on the top of the Holiday Inn in Hollywood and we were like pissing off the roof. And it was like the best thing for like an 18 year old kid. Like you're like, you're like, this is the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> and like the cameras and it's just, it was just awesome. And then I had another five weeks of like, if you watch that film and you try to find me in it, uh, you will be shocked that there were five weeks worth of work with me, but, um, the, but it was cool. You know, I got to tell David Duchovny that he was Metallica breath. So, <laughs> you know, um, I, I, I was arguing with the director going, please, it's the stupidest line in the world. Don't make me say that line. And then we went to the cast and crew screening later on. It was the, it got the biggest laugh of the entire thing. So, um, yeah, it was, um, I look, I, I loved it. It was just like, uh, it's it's one of those moments if you've ever been on a film set i and you and you have any sense of the magic of a film set like i don't know how other people feel about it but to me film set is magic i like the reason i want to build an independent film studio is because i want to live on a film set like i want to be making movies all the time and so that's how i felt there i mean it was um It was fantastic. At the time, you don't think that it's going to, I mean, I thought it was a throwaway film. I thought it was never, you know, it would come and go in one summer. And the fact that it still exists, they originally are called it the real world. That was their working title. And then a show called the real world came out on MTV, which is the first reality show. And uh, so we had to change our title. And they told us at the, at the cast and crew screen that was going to be called don't tell mom, the babysitter's dead. And everyone went, Oh my God. <laughs> Everybody thought this was the worst thing ever. I think it's only because of the title that we still remember it today. <laughs> I mean, well, it's a cute film, but uh, yeah, that it, title, you know. <laughs> and I'm usually not a fan of long titles when it comes yeah. to films, but with the exception to that, it's when you hear the title, you just instantly think of certain scenes and it just sparks so many memories. So it's, it's a sure. fun, it's a fun title and it's a fun movie. And I think it goes to like for as as a takeaway for for aspiring filmmakers, if you want to make a comedy, make a funny title like it just it's a if you want to make a, a horror film, make a scary title like it's you know, it, it like that is there's something to be said for that. You know, if you're creating if you're creating a creative work, you want everything to be memorable. You want it to be something that's going to stick in the read in the in the viewer's mind, the audience's you know, tap into that zeitgeist and all that. I think that movie definitely did. Um, it's shocking to me that even all these years later, people still <laughs> think about it. But, um, but yeah, it was, it, I was fortunate to have gotten cast. So, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, one of the last questions, what is your, I, I always like to ask all my guests this, what is your favorite movie of all time? Yeah, I, this is always a hard one for me because I literally have hundreds of favorite movies and it really depends on where I am at the time. Um, I like little tiny movies all the way to big, huge movies. So it's, I don't know. I mean, I can always, I can just go with the classics of like uh, Shawshank Redemption or or that Back to the Future or um, maybe even just stick with Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter Dead for that matter. <laughs> Um, Shawshank and Back to the Future I I consider those to be like there's a a small list of what I consider to be perfect movies I would put both of those in that that category I would too and I and I would think and I would say to 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 qualify as a perfect movie I don't think you could change I don't think you would need to change a single thing that would improve it and so uh story or the way it was shot. And I think both of those definitely qualify. So, but there's, I mean, there's just with thousands and thousands of films having been made and some just extraordinary stuff over time. Like it's, it feels a little lame to go to the obvious ones, (laughs) but um, it's just always a tough, it's just always a tough question. There's, there's, I, I, what I'm a big fan of is actually trying to find little uh, indie voices and find, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll give you one that no one's ever heard of that I think is a great little movie and it's called, um, uh, oh crap, <laughs> no, I just, no, I just, the title uh, escaped me. Hang on. No, <laughs> I just did that and now I can't remember the title. Um, co- coherence, is it Coherence? Hang on, I gotta look it up now. I do like that title, though. 
coherence. If it's not a title for a film, it should be. Yeah, it is coherence. That's the one. Okay. Coherence. Yeah. Um, it's a little tiny film. And the reason I like it is because it, it, it has a really cool premise that is a bit of a brain teaser uh, that, and they made it for like nothing. I don't know the people who made it. I don't know the story behind it, but it's, uh, it's, it's just one of these little films that, um, that if you're, if you're interested in making indie films, I think it's a, it's the kind of thing that you would want to do. I don't know that they marketed it well enough at the time. And so it didn't sort of get huge notice, but, um, worth a watch, I'd say. So I'll check it if out. Want, if you want something that's not the obvious, uh, Shawshank or Back to the Future. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll, I'll check it out. Uh, Cause I yeah. I'm with you. I like discovering new indie movies, no matter how big or small they are. So I'll look that up and yeah. check it out for sure. And then a last question, uh, do you have a website or social media you'd like to plug so the listeners can follow you? Yeah, uh, uh, fastscreenplay.com is probably the easiest way to find me. We, I'm fast screenplay on all the socials. Uh, don't keep up with the socials that much, but on, on the website, uh, you can subscribe to a daily uh, email, daily-ish email that we, uh, that we put out for screenwriters uh, to help people get more creative uh, I'm putting out a thing shortly here, which maybe by the time you're done, or maybe shortly after that, uh, called uh, the Effortless Pages, which is all about. I mean, most people struggle with their creativity; they struggle to find time to write and all that. Uh, and so, I'm basically putting together a very cool new resource to help people on 10 minutes a day, uh, sort of exercise and develop their creative muscles, so that they can ultimately develop screenplays. Love it. No, I'm yeah. excited, excited to, to see what comes of it. It's very, it's going to be very cool. I'm yeah. very excited about it. We, there's a lot of cool things that we're doing. So I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to put too many, too many <laughs> things out there just because uh, it'll confuse everybody, but uh, fast screenplay is always the easiest one. So yeah. Awesome. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for taking the time to have this chat. This was awesome. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. Well, if you want to subscribe to the show, head over to linktree.com slash feature press pod. You can find all the, uh, podcast subscription information, social media, everything's at linktree.com slash futurepresspod. And don't forget, we're live on Monday nights on YouTube at 8 p.m. Central Time. That's going to do it for this week's show. So we'll see you guys next week for another exciting episode of the Future Presentation Podcast. Podcast.